And I think my first aha is that I want a chair like Megan's. It looks pretty awesome. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> it makes me feel very empowered. <laughs> Yes, I second Carly on that one. That is an amazing chair. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Craigslist find. So, uh, if we want to go ahead and get started, we can. It's a couple minutes after one. Um, but if you want to give a couple people two more minutes, that's that's up to you. But I was just letting you know. <laughs> sure, let's get started. Okay, so thanks for joining our Women in Biotech and Pharma panel. Uh, we're going to go through some introductions and then jump over to the questions. So, I'm Megan Crum. I'll be moderating. I've been in this industry for about 12 years. I'm currently a senior project engineer at Avexis. Um, I really love what I do. I love going to work every day. Um, it's a startup, so it's a lot of long days, but it's going to be worth it. So um, I previously have worked at Biogen and I've also worked at Merck. So I'll pass it over to Melissa for their, her to introduce herself. Yeah, so um, glad to be here today. My name is Melissa Seymour. I currently lead the global QC organization at Biogen, so worked with Megan before in the past. Um, spent a lot of time at Biogen. I've had careers in manufacturing, quality QC, um, all in the biotech space, and looking forward to this conversation today. So with that, maybe Jennifer, you could introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lauria Clark. I'm the executive director at CAI, which is a global consulting firm. And we support clients like where Melissa works at Biogen and Megan at Avexis. And I support our business development and marketing teams. And prior to that, I worked in the field for eight years doing the services that I sell. So it's a pretty neat perspective that I've followed that through in my career and I'm very excited about this panel today and I'm also um, in the Jenkins MBA program as well earning my MBA um, trying to over the next couple years and um, with that Betty you want to introduce yourself sure good afternoon everybody uh, my name is Betty Metton I spent about 40 years um, in the supply chain field the last um, 20 well 29 years at GSK I'm in supply chain, primarily in uh, global logistics and procurement. Uh, when I retired, actually, almost six years ago, I started uh, working part-time at NC State in the supply chain practicum arena, so working with the students on supply chain. Um, I'm also a consultant for a firm called Burrow Life Sciences, and we work in the life sciences area where I do mostly supply chain work, and we tend to work mainly with startup uh, pharma and biotech companies. And with that, I will pass this over to Erin. Hello. Um, I'm not entirely sure what I'm what I'm saying here. <laughs> I'm the uh, panel ambassador. So I'm currently a full time uh, MBA student in my second year, uh, I will be graduating in May, um, making that transition from full time in person now to online. Thank you to COVID. Um, I am I've been in biotech for nine years. I started off as a bench scientist in molecular biology and am making this transition into business now, uh, focusing mainly on the marketing, uh, marketing, product development, product management side of things. Um, I interned at Biogen over this past summer in their Cambridge site, so it's, it's nice to be amongst uh, fellow Biogenians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm just really looking forward to hearing what you wonderful women have to say about your experiences in biotech in this, uh, in this crazy world we live in now. Great. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, should I, I'll briefly, really quickly talk, uh, let Carly and Andrew and Ryan kind of introduce themselves a little bit. I'm the primary panel, but they've done a lot of work as well. And so I want them to get a little bit of a highlight if they, if they can. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron. 
Um, so I'm Carly Elkins. I am a dual degree MBA and MMB student, um, which is microbial uh, biotechnology master's. Um, so in the same position as Aaron, finishing up my MBA um, in May and online. Um, and I have I've gone straight through school, but have been working in the pharmaceutical and biotech area um, recently. So. Cool. Um, my name's Andrew, and I'm also in the MMB MBA dual degree program. Um, unlike Carly, I actually had a little bit of a non-traditional start. I kind of went into industry first, uh, in a different industry rather, with uh, UPS and logistics. But then had a knew I love science, wanted to come back to it, so I came back to school. Um, had a undergrad in molecular biology, pendulum swing too far, uh, did some bench work for about a year outside of that, um, realized that while I love science, the bench work wasn't necessarily um, what I really enjoyed the most, and so that I found the MMB program, which with the MBA kind of smashes the two together, science and business, um, and I've had a, a different host of experiences from working in a boutique consulting group um, to working at a the Sanford Pfizer site here locally, and then also at a corporate site out in uh, Chicago this past summer. Okay, do we have one more? I believe Ryan was on, but he's, so Ryan's been um, working very hard as our tech person. So I think he's bouncing between all the different Zoom rooms to make sure that everybody's, everybody's good. But he, um, he is an MMB himself as well, um, and he's he's been like I said integral in all of this working the tech. So, um, yeah, just thumbs up to him if he gets a chance to see this video later. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and kick off the questions. So our first question is: Can you discuss what your company is doing to empower women in the industry? Jen, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, at CAI, we are a blended group of people, as most of the technical fields are, and we do have a women at CAI group that is um, on Microsoft Teams where we share resources, we support each other, talk about different things that are going on in the industry. But as a whole, CAI does not have just a women's initiative that has funding and does different things because we don't want to have siloed groups of people within the organization. Uh, we're a global employee owned company. We want everyone to feel like they are, have an equal voice. So we support professional development for everyone at our company. So 100% of our employees are entitled to go to a women's conference, a men's conference, um, specific to their experience and what they wanna learn and grow with. So it's pretty cool that we, um, we support that. We also are very engaged with ISPE and they have a women in pharma group and they have mentor circles. So our ladies are starting a women in pharma mentor circle within our organization that's just CAI people, but it's still not funded and not using any dollars from CAI. So we might be a little different than some of the other people. Um, I know a lot of the different big pharma companies have women's initiatives. And uh, Melissa, you want to tell us a little bit about Biogen? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So um, it is, to your point, a, a little different at Biogen. We have um, a very active diversity and inclusion function that sits in corporate. And as a result, we have what we call employee resource networks. And those span across women's initiatives, men's initiatives, um, diversity and minorities, whether it's um, disabilities or elsewise, we have multiple ERNs. One of those, of course, is the Women's Innovation Network, um, which exists at all of our Biogen sites. And it's funded through Biogen and allows us the opportunity to work together as women. But to your point earlier, we also encourage men to attend these uh, WIN events. And we get quite good participation for men to understand how they can interact with women in the workplace and be part of the solutions and um, bringing more women into the STEM environment. One of the other really cool programs that Biogen has sponsored and actually started as part of the DNI function um, was a, a program called Boardroom Ready, which is now industry-wide, which focuses on putting women in board positions in the biotech industry 
which is an area that's been somewhat ignored over the last 20 years where we've seen growth in women in STEM, but not so much in the C-suite and board. Um, Megan, I don't know if we wanted to move to the next question or if someone else wanted to add to that. Anything to add? All right. Our next question is, can you tell us how a specific person or experience has shaped your career path? Eddie, I think you're gonna get us started with that one, right? Yes, great. Well, I, I have been very fortunate in my career to have a lot of people to support me um, starting out and realizing that I'm probably older than a lot of people on the panel. Um, when I started out in the late 70s <laughs> um, at work, I, I really did not have a lot of experience. Uh, I didn't even have a business degree. So when I went into a manufacturing type environment, it was, it was great that I had a really good boss. And I can remember he just, uh, I, I, I didn't know what a mentor was, but I think mentoring is so important. And he came to me and he just kind of took me under his wing. And he, he gave me some really concrete feedback to let me know what I was not doing right and, and how important it was, um, how I was perceived. I, I was in a group, um, it was a procurement group actually in a factory and I, I was the only woman and everyone I worked with were all men. And he gave me a lot of really good advice on how I was perceived. I was also quite timid. So I had, I had that going for me. I was young, I was timid, I was a woman. He did a lot to teach me um, to really take up for myself and not be afraid to speak up. I can remember there was a, a guy in the warehouse that I, I worked with a lot and he always called me sweetheart and I never even met him. As, as a matter of fact, in two years, I never met him. And I remember I was just too timid to really say anything and he really encouraged me to speak up but in a professional way to really, really take up for myself. Um, and through my career, certainly when I, when I started at Glaxo, which is when Glaxo first started at the manufacturing facility in Zebulon in 1984, <laughs> um, again, it was, a, it was a really good environment at that time. And I had a, a mentor and I actually went and I picked him out because he was the kind of leader that I thought that I wanted to be because he was kind of a quiet leader. Um, but I really admired him. To be honest, there weren't a lot of women um, in that day for mentorship, although I did reach out to some and they were very helpful. But I can remember that he gave me some really good concrete feedback. Um, and I, I can remember him telling me, and I, and I remember this throughout my career, to be sure that I had a career path mapped out, but to also, if I wanted to be a leader, that leaders have to step up. So rather than sitting and listening and never participating and, and not volunteering for anything that, you know, leaders, you know, leaders lead, they step out. And that, that's what I did. And we went through two pretty painful mergers. And at that time, you know, I volunteered for everything to lead all the teams, to do anything that I could, which worked out really well for me from the perspective of, of I, I received big promotions after each one of those. But I, I, to be honest, I don't know where I would be if I did not have mentors to help me along the way, especially when I first started out. And it's extremely important. And I, I mentored a lot of people in my career and I was always very impressed with the people who came up to me and asked me to do that for them. And I feel like I do that a lot with my practicum students now. It's something that I, I think is extremely, extremely important. We kind of had, as a group of women, um, we, we had our own little groups and you know a lot of them were wine parties where <laughs> we just got together and just talked about how we can help each other which I think is really so important that women really have to be out there to help women especially where we have really good women leaders it's really important to make important to make ourselves really accessible to other women and to help them out Eddie, that's a great message. I love that. Um, so I just want to dive a little bit deeper. You mentioned a lot about mentorship, but how, how about finding a sponsor? That can be more difficult. It can be difficult. And at GSK, we actually had in our division, we had formal programs for that, which uh, 
I think is, is a real advantage in being in this industry and to be honest, being in big pharma, where we have those kind of resources. Because sometimes I think you all almost have to, to force people kind of into that, but it was um, a very inclusive uh, area. So having a sponsor, I just can't say enough about how critically important, whether it's a sponsor or a mentor, to have someone to give you really good constructive feedback, even when it hurts. And I, and I had a lot of feedback that hurt, <laughs> but that, that was really the feedback that helped me the most. Melissa, Jen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so sure, I, I can jump in. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with everything that Betty, Betty was speaking about, and it, it's been somewhat my experience as well. Um, I think having mentors, both male and female, are, are super helpful. But to your point, sponsorship is even more important. And I think one thing in particular that women may struggle with sometimes is being comfortable and asking someone to sponsor them and be that voice at the table when they're not there to speak about their abilities and their technical skills and their leadership qualities. And what I found throughout my career is people male and female leaders alike are most most of them are very happy to support you if you're looking to move your career forward it's just a matter of asking right and i think the worst thing that can happen is that they say no right and you haven't lost anything but it seems to have to be a very difficult conversation for people to have and i would say 90 percent of the time when i've approached people about being sponsors they've been more than happy to be there and it's hugely important as you progress in your career to have sponsors at the right place at the right time. Jennifer? Yeah, I would just echo everything that Betty and Melissa said. And don't be afraid to ask a man to be a sponsor for you. I can, I can wholeheartedly say I've never felt like any man has ever kept me down from doing anything or any woman for that matter. But I, I think you should have a diverse group of people that are your support network and that should be men and women at different levels of the industry from professional society engagement um, or within your organization. And Betty, I completely sympathize with your constructive criticism that it hurts. And I have a colleague who he is brutal, but I am much better for it in the end. And I appreciate, um, I appreciate his brutal honesty because I think that it's out of genuine trust and caring. And you have to have that emotional bond with somebody in order to have that and you have to work at it. So go out and find one if you don't have one, guys. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely find one that's willing to be honest with you, right? And give you real feedback because it's a lot more difficult to give real feedback than it is to give positive reinforcement, right? And, um, that's great. All right. So as I think that we're all very much aware, the biotech and pharma industries are very much male dominated. Uh, I wanted us to all expand on our experiences and how we overcome stereotypes and professional development hurdles. So I'm actually gonna start with this one. So I've always worked in an engineering and maintenance environment. Um, many times over the past 12 years have I always been the only woman on the team. Uh, one thing that I feel like has made me successful is my willingness to always jump in no matter what the problem is. And I also ask a lot of questions. And I think that by asking a lot of questions, I give everyone on the team a chance to provide their, their input and their feedback. Um, even those that maybe sometimes try to struggle to find their voice. So I just, I think that's something that's, that's really helped me in the past, making sure that I take a moment to make sure that everyone's heard. So another key point is that I've really tried to own my own development plan. Um, this alone, I think has, will set anyone apart. So many are hesitant to do this. Um, just because you come to work every day and just because you work really hard, that doesn't mean that you're going to just have opportunities handed to you. Uh, I think that most opportunities come when you identify them yourself. If you see something you and you have, see an opportunity to make something better, you have to speak up, you have to get involved, and you have to recruit others to help them. Melissa, Betty, Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, Aki Ken, I'll just say, you know, I, I agree with everything that Megan said. 
And I think, and uh, I also certainly, when I started out, and, and when I started out was a long time ago, so I, I was also in a lot of, in manufacturing, so there were a lot of men around. And, um, I, and I had great working relationships. So I think a lot is building relationships and building that trust, just like you do with any team, just like you do with any colleague. It's, it's making sure they can trust you, that you do what you say you're going to do, that you step up when they need for you to step up. And I don't think it takes long for anybody, male or female, to realize you know, who, who's going who's gonna to have their back, who's going to do a good job, who you can count on. And I think that is extremely important. But, you know, don't be afraid to, to step out of your comfort zone a little bit. And I think for certainly for me, that was definitely out of my comfort zone. It was not where I was used to being on those kind of teams. So sometimes um, it, was, it was challenging for me. And I can remember, you know, a mentor telling me that, you know, if, if you want to sit at the table, you've got to believe yourself that you belong there. And so it really takes a lot of, of getting out of your comfort zone, but certainly working, you know, in any environment, it's, it's really about, about trust and building that kind of teamwork. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Are there any specific areas of development, whether it be technical or professional, that women in biotech need to focus on to be successful? Melissa, can you kick us off? Yeah, sure. So I think the technical piece is, is important, yes. And, and maybe going back to the last question for a second, I think coming into the industry almost 30 years ago, much like Betty, I was the only woman in the room and, and just out of college and, and timid at the same time. And so it was not, not a great combination. Um, and over time, I, I think I learned that the first piece is the technical piece, right? If you can make people understand that you really know what you're doing, right? And earn that trust and build that trust. Then I think the most important thing really for developing in the industry is more of the soft skills. So building your network, um, driving communications, owning your development plan, talking to the right people, really spending that time. And I know Megan, you mentioned it a little bit is really thinking about where do I want to go and how do I want to get there? And who are the people that I need to connect with to make that an easier path and really focusing on how do I make that path easier for myself? You have to own it. And you have to be willing to go outside of your comfort zone to build your network and to build those communications, to have those sponsors, to have those mentors, and to make sure everyone in your organization knows the path that you're on because that's what's going to get you there. A technical is important and it's easy to me much easier to understand that um, than it is to really build that network and build the social skills and the, the soft skills that will help you in leadership throughout the organization. I would oh. no go right ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I would definitely agree with Melissa. I know that I'm much better at my job today because I had done the technical stuff before. So it's it's not always easy to understand how to sell something or market something. But the fact that I've been in my steel toe boots and my T-shirt and I've walked the floors of Biogen and GSK and other companies within my career from a working standpoint, it has made me that much better. And it's not saying you can't get to where Melissa is without doing the more technical stuff, but you're going to get there a lot faster and be a lot more respected and better at your job if you've put in that time. And um, I think if you ever have the opportunity to stretch and to go into something, women are much more timid about not doing that kind of thing. And that's where the sponsors and your champions are that much more important for you because they should be pushing you into those roles and helping you uh, gain the confidence in order to get where you want to be to follow your career path plan. Yep. Okay. okay. So just to add to that a little bit about seeking feedback. So I think it's so important to seek feedback in the moment. I mean, how many of us have walked out of a meeting that we were leading and we just weren't sure, right? We just weren't sure like how the, how the entire room felt about the information that we were trying to give them. So something that I've found to be really useful is to reach out afterwards immediately, right? And maybe get a fresh perspective, like reach outside of your core network or maybe even outside of your team to someone you don't know as well and can give you better feedback on that situation. 
Okay. All right. What does allyship look like in the field? Jane, can you take this? Sure. I think we talked a lot today about allies and mentors and sponsors and champions, and um, they all mean something different to me. And I think that you have to figure out who's your allies and who is who's working against you, who's working with you, what is that person bringing you within your organization. And I have some allies in my organization that that that's not that that's just it, but that's it. They're my allies. And I have to find that some of the skill sets that I need are different than when I'm dealing with people that are my champions or my sponsors or even my mentors. So for me, it's, I have to have a lot of patience. I'm sure a lot of us have to have a lot of patience in um, what we do and like it or not, men and women do think differently. So when you have men allies versus women allies, your conversations are gonna be a little bit different. When you're, when you're dealing with men, you need to have those facts and you need to understand you know, their, their empathy level might not be as high as if you're talking to a woman. And um, I would not say that my female allies expect any less of me than my male allies, but I think that the communication and how you communicate with them in order to make sure you guys are reaching what you need to do for work um, is is there. So we've we've talked a lot about mentoring and allying. I don't know how much more we want to go into. I don't know if Betty or you or Melissa have anything else. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that I do think, and, and maybe Betty mentioned it earlier. I I think as females in a field that that still is male dominated, um, albeit not as much as it was when I started. I think it's important that, you know, we provide that allyship for other females that are that are interested in developing their careers. And I know personally, I, I'm probably mentoring eight to 10 women right now. And honestly, I get as much out of those conversations, I think, as they do, because I think it continues to build my understanding of how women are working and how they're interacting with men and how that's changing over time. So it helps us to stay connected as leaders to continue to develop women within the organization. And it's something that I hope continues. Well, so I think that's great feedback because it can be nerve wracking to ask a senior leader for, for some of their time, right, to develop those relationships. So I think it's, uh, it's really great to hear that you guys get as much out of it. So, all right. Who is at the table and who is still missing? Betty, Melissa? I can start. I didn't volunteer because I, I wasn't sure exactly. When I looked at this last night, I really thought a lot about this <laughs> and how to answer this question and what this means as far as being at the table. And I guess I can go back to what a mentor told me that I already mentioned as far as, you know, if you want to sit at the table, you better be sure that you believe that you belong to be there. And I think a lot of it is, is about building confidence. Um, and for me, um, because I started so long ago into what, I, I can't remember whoever said it, but I think, you know, I was, I, I, yeah, I was not a business major. So I didn't even, I came into an area where I didn't feel like I even had the technical skills. Um, I was in a, a male dominated field and I was very timid and shy. And I certainly, and I was Southern, so I was not raised to ever speak up. So a lot of it was really around, you know, having to build my own confidence and have confidence in myself. And I, I had a lot of failures along the way to really look at, um, you know, how I was perceived. And, and I think for a while I even tried to be someone that I wasn't. So I think I, I had a lot of really good feedback and some of it, some of the feedback I received was actually from people who worked for me, um, from people on my team who helped me understand what my strengths were and certainly what some of my weaknesses were. And this really helped me to understand that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I have to be who I am and I have to manage and operate in an area that where I'm comfort, comfortable. And even though I have to get out of my comfort level and I did throughout my career, it certainly was, it's, I guess one of the big learnings for me was, you know, it's okay for men and women to manage differently because I think they do. But we just have to be sure as women that we're speaking up, that we're building our confidence 
and that we show that we belong at the table. And I think, you know, there's, there should be nothing holding us back. And a lot of it, I think we, we tend to hold ourselves back a little bit. And I, and I can't say enough about how women have to be there to help other women because you know, throughout my career, one of the things I found, even though I had some wonderful women um, allies, um, I also ran into a lot of women who weren't very good allies where, and I have to say throughout my career, I probably had a lot more help with men than I did with women. So I think if we want a place at the table, we as women have to be there for each other and have to be there to help each other and to mentor each other and to, to, to just really, you know, be there for each other, and maybe stop some of the, the competitiveness. I think one thing is you just have to start acting like you're sitting at the table and, uh, and at CAI there's, there's really no, there's no limit the way we work. There's always another startup coming. So we always need managers. We always need project managers. We always need client site managers. So that competitiveness isn't quite there. Like it might be in other companies where there's one of the specific role. So what we always joke about and say, you just start doing the job you want. And yeah, you have to work a lot harder, not just a little bit, but you have to work a lot harder because you're not only doing the job you want. I see Melissa shaking her head. You're doing the job that you also already have, which is probably a lot more than you can already handle to begin with. And so you just start doing it. And that's what I've pretty much done my entire career. And I found myself at our executive table um, I'm not an officer of CAI yet. One day I would like to be, but I've been invited to the officer meeting since last July with a couple other people that they're growing in the succession plan. So, and I'm okay with that. I'm perfectly okay with not having that title yet, but being a part of being at the table because I've, I've taken the feedback and the constructive criticism. And that's part of the reason I've started my MBA is because I need that business background. I have a engineering degree background, but it's the business background that I also need to be more well-rounded to get, get that complete seat at the table. And I'm working to do that um, extra hard, I would say. Yeah, can I just add to that a little bit? I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, we've seen great growth. But for me, being in the industry for 30 years, there's been significant change with, with women in the industry and women in positions in management and, and directors in our organization, but we're not quite there yet when it comes to C-suite and board level positions. In the Fortune 1000 companies, there's less than 20% women on boards. And so when we look at our own careers and how we develop other women and how we work together, I think it's important to get that diversity into the boardroom across the industry because that's when we'll start to see real difference. And I think that's hugely important and, and something that we can all work together to get to. Um, one of the programs that I did attend through Biogen is this boardroom ready program. And I've been so impressed with the women that are in that program and the camaraderie and the help and the networking that I have across those women is really incredible. And it, it's, it's great to see that kind of allyship within um, women. I think a lot of the competition is going away. Uh, the theme that I keep hearing is to be proactive and to reach out and step up. And I think it's, it's such a great message because you, to get to that top level position, you're not going to do it on your own, right? You're gonna have to have the support uh, of those around you. So, but you have to make the first step, right? It's, uh, it's not just going to fall to you. Okay. We did add one additional question. So how has investing in your MBA helped your career? So I can, I can start because I think Betty and I have MBAs and I know um, Jennifer, Megan, you're, you're working on that, right? So right in the middle of it. I, I feel for you with full-time jobs when you're MBAs. Um, I, I did mine when my, my twins were maybe three years old. So I, I don't remember sleep during those days. But, um, you know, I, I come from a technical background, much like, like Jennifer. I, my background's in biochemistry. Um, 
and I moved into management pretty quickly, but there were a lot of things that potentially I didn't understand. Um, and, and I did, I'll, I'll say I went, I got my MBA at Duke. I did get my undergrad at NC State. So I do have that going for me. Um, but I did a, a global cultural immersion as part of my MBA. And I think some of the biggest learnings that came out of that were really, um, you know, dealing with different cultures, dealing with people, leadership um, skills. I, I, I certainly understand accounting and finance better than I did, and I understand the business model, and so it's easier to have those broader conversations and sit at, you know, operational things and understand what other people are doing. But I feel like some of those soft skills um, really gave me more confidence. And when that confidence comes through, I think that's when people start to see you in those leadership roles, when you do that confidence and you understand the bigger pieces of the business. So I wouldn't say it's any one specific part of the MBA, but the overall kind of visibility that you get and the understanding that you have of the broader organization then drives you to be more confident. And that, I think, gets you recognized and, and probably gets you more on that leadership path. Betty? Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with Melissa on the soft skills. Um, at, at GSK, or at the time that I went for my MBA, I think it was Glaxo, um, in order to move up in the organization, uh, education was really important. It was, it was the type of industry where there were a lot of very well-educated people. So we're working with a lot of people and certainly in manufacturing, we work with development people. So we really, you know, it was in my development plan very early on. I was very fortunate that I worked for a company that was willing to pay for it. Um, like Melissa, it's kind of a, a, a blurb to me because um, I, I was actually was promoted during the time I was working on my MBA. So I had kind of my old job, my new job, uh, going to school at night, and it was um, a very challenging time. But I think that itself really taught me a lot about um, setting priorities and multitasking. Um, it was a really safe environment for me in school where I really learned a lot about communication and a lot about those soft skills. We did a lot of working on teams and I really learned a lot about how to work. Uh, and that was very beneficial for me. And because I was kind of in a, in a business area but didn't have a business degree, it was important for me to be able to, to talk the talk um, and from an accounting perspective, um, but certainly the, the biggest thing for me, and I, I met, um, and I went to Meredith, so at the time it was all women, um, because there, there were no night programs um, anywhere around except for Meredith, and I think Duke. Um, so I went to Meredith, which was maybe a little bit of a different environment because the, the only men were the professors, which is kind of weird. Um, so I was working with women all the time, but it really taught me a lot. I, I have contacts there that people I met there that I still am in contact with. And I just learned a lot about how to work. Um, I certainly learned, I, I learned, um, I learned Lotus there. <laughs> no, we didn't have Excel then, I don't think. But, but I learned some of the, the technical skills there that um, I quite frankly didn't have time to learn at work. So it was a really great experience for me. And as I look back at that, when I retired and went into my second career um, at NC State, I, I would not be able to do what I'm doing if I did not have an MBA. So I will always thank Glaxo for that opportunity that they gave me um, to be able to continue to learn and to have that degree, which really helped me, has helped me throughout my whole life because it allowed me to kind of go into my second career. And I think that one thing that is extremely important that, that I've learned um, from being out in the workforce for a really long time is you have to keep learning always and you have to stay up to date. And, you know, as someone, and maybe Melissa can relate to that, who started out in a career where there were no computers. I mean, we used to key punch. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and I saw some of my colleagues through the years, especially the last few years, because we kind of all started out at Glaxo at the same time, um, really at a disadvantage when they were not willing to upskill. 
and to keep their skills current. Uh, and, and it's just so very important throughout your career and really for just your own self-esteem to always keep learning. So I'm a real proponent of, um, of going back to school, taking courses, doing anything you can to continue to, to learn and grow. Megan, I just want to add real quick, I know we're running short on time here, but the investment in my MBA, I don't even have it yet, but it has set me on an officer track for my organization. And um, Betty and I had just met a couple days ago, but I'm, I'm a Glaxo kid. My dad worked at Glaxo for a long time, and I know they took pride in the education and empowering and diversity. And I think that's kind of how I grew up. And my mom was a teacher and tying into the collaboration theme. I mean, I had it from all sides growing up. There really wasn't a choice except to excel and make sure that you were doing your best along the way. And I think that the MBA so far and the classes that I've taken, I can tell a difference in my thought process and being more strategic. And I'm only four classes in. And um, Meg and I are doing it together, actually, um, one online and one in person. So it's always misery loves company, um, but it's, um, it's, it's been really good. And I think the last thing that it does for us and for all of you guys that are in the program that are listening, it sets you apart from your peers. Because as you just heard Betty and Melissa explain, it's not easy. I mean, finding the time and you think, oh, it's only four or five hours a week, but trying to do that, and people that have it know, and they're gonna give you more kudos and they're gonna look at you differently, that you're, you're elevated in their mind if you go through this process and you, you finish and earn your MBA. Yeah, I think that's a great message. All right, so it looks like we have eight minutes for Q&A. Uh, if there's any questions from the audience, if you could just type it into the, into the group chat window. Right. What is it like to start off with a STEM degree and starting an MBA? What are the roadblocks along the way? I can, I mean, I'm, if, if I understand the question right, um, my, my bachelor's degree was in, in biology and biochemistry. And so I was in industry for many years before I went back for my MBA. So, so a big challenge was really just getting back into kind of studying and learning and time management. Um, but I think from the perspective, you know, a, a technical degree does give you um, a lot of the building blocks that you need as you move into an MBA. I, I could say my, my most difficult task was accounting, which seemed like a foreign language to me. Um, but I think if you're interested in learning, and most people that are in those STEM type programs are learners, and I think that gives you the building blocks that you need to be successful in an MBA. Okay, our next question. MBA versus PNP, if you're wanting to say more technical, any opinions on that? I know, Lee, she's uh, one of my colleagues. I would say if you're looking to go into more project management track and really become an SME in project management and do large program in project management, that your PNP is better suited for your career path. Uh, but if you ever want to own your business one day, you ever want to, you know, run a division or have a larger role, the MBA is not going to hurt. And I would, not that I say they are not even in the same category, you know, PMP is a certification and gets you one technical specialty, which is the project management piece. But the MBA, you get all of that. Um, you don't get the PMP certificate, but you get everything with the MBA from the financial, the marketing, the supply chain. You, you get a very well-rounded education when you get an MBA. So I'd like to go back to the previous question, just kind of coming from a STEM background. So I think I probably have a similar experience to Melissa in that my undergrad degree was biology. And coming straight out of school, I picked up in a position that was more engineering focused. And I've always been on the engineering side of things. Um, 
and now I'm in class with everyone that has a very different perspective. Um, there are a lot of my classmates that have business degrees, and it's been it's been really um, interesting to like hear like things just from a, just from that different perspective, um, and it's it's challenging me to change the way I think as well. That's a really good point. Just, um, I think you were saying how, Jennifer, how it makes you think differently. And I think some of that is in during MBA programs, no matter where you take them, you're typically thrown together with people from all different backgrounds, and in my case, from all different cultures. And so just understanding that people perceive things differently makes you think differently yourself. And I think that's a big benefit of an MBA. Yeah, one of my first classes was, um, was actually marketing class and I run our marketing department and my group, I just had such a hard time because they're like, you have to type and talk in the way a professor wants you to talk, not the way your board wants you to talk. And <laughs> that was honestly one of my biggest struggles um, for sure. Oh, Megan, there's one more question. Um, okay. You might wanna grab. Sure. All right, how do you balance life? Kids, health, school, et cetera. This is a loaded question. <laughs> well, also trying to succeed and move up in your career. How do you not overwork yourself? So, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back to my MBA, right? I, I, and, and this is always funny if you talk to people with MBAs, they feel like they have, you know, if I could just get through this MBA, I'll have free time, right? And somehow when you're done with your MBA, it trust me, it goes away. Like you don't have free time. I, I find that scheduling time is super important. And you know, one thing that women in general will do will they we will put everyone else first, um, and then maybe not get to that health piece. And I would say to the people that are on this call, do not do that. It's too important, or right? you have to take care of yourself. Um, it can be challenging to have a family and kids and sports and school and um, work, but it's doable, right? I think it's all about time management, but be conscious of that and make time for yourself along with that, or you will burn yourself out. I think a lot of the stuff that's happened today is a lot of stuff about collaboration. And that doesn't just mean at work. Collaboration with, last night, Megan, I joked beforehand, um, this, this beautiful background here, Megan was on FaceTime with my children and me for a couple hours last night. And I know Megan thought I was crazy, but I wanted it to look pretty for you today, but she's got my kids showing her stuff and, you know, doing things. My CEO had to FaceTime me today because his cell phone service doesn't work great at his house and my daughters are saying hello to him. And I think that's <laughs> just, that's part of the new norm, you know, and it's, it's just kind of, especially the new norm of all of us working from home right now, you know, my, all my MBA group partners know my children. They know my husband, they see them walk in, we're in group meetings, your spouses are bringing you dinner because you're trying to do homework and you're, you're collaborating and it's just, it's just a big balance and it's, sometimes it's going to be off balance pretty much every time and you just have to make sure that it's not always choosing your family or always choosing work that you're you're just making time for and my friends make fun of me i schedule family time and i schedule blocks on my calendar and if i go to lunch with friends i block off that time on my calendar so it doesn't it doesn't interfere so i still i still have a life um and a good one when we get done with this mba program Well, we have hit our 150 mark. Um, we're getting ready for a 10 minute break before the next session and the chat is uh, the schedule for everything. I would like to personally thank you for wonderful women for taking time, for attending this conference, for teaching us innovation, teaching us how to stay uh, strong in the face of criticism or constructive feedback, knowing to take that not personally, um, really reiterating the fact that, you know, step up, be at the table, know you belong there, um, not being afraid of that male allyship, male mentorship, um, and uh, something that's, that really kind of struck me uh, was the comment of, 
not all women are your allies either. And sometimes you have to be aware of that too. And I think that's um, a good thing to note, but it's also important to note that, you know, the table is not, it's not finite, it's infinite. We have, we have room for everyone. So thank you so much. Um, I, I love that we had this panel as a, as a woman of STEM moving into business as well. This was very meaningful to me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for joining and calling in today. We appreciate it. Yes. yes. Thank you, everybody. We're you. facing challenging times and I'm, I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of the, the IWC for, for coming up with this new method. Completely okay. agree. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.